everyone, my name is Rachel. Welcome back to my channel today. I am bringing you guys my December mid-month reading wrap-up, which it's going to be a little weird getting back into the swing of things of doing these mid-month wrap-ups and end-of-the-month wrap-ups because in October, November, I was doing weekly wrap-ups. And so I have a lot more books to talk about in today's video than I have been talking about in previous wrap-ups. What is helpful is that I talked about quite a few of these books in my Tis the Season-a-thon reading vlog. I will of course link that up in the cards above. So that readathon took place November 30th through December 6th. So yeah, quite a few of these books I have already talked about in depth. So I'm just gonna like quickly go through some of these. And then I've also read some new favorites of mine and I am really really excited to talk about these books with you all. So without further ado, let's just get into it. The first book that I read this month was A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I did listen to the audiobook by Audible and what was amazing about this audiobook in particular was that there was a full cast of voice actors which I always appreciate but also they went above and beyond with the production value. There are all kinds of sound effects and music and things like that. So if you're someone like me who for some reason hasn't read the original story of A Christmas Carol, I highly recommend doing so this holiday season and going with this audiobook, especially if you have Audible because this is included in the Audible Plus catalog. Next up we have Anna Holidays by Christina Lauren. So I gave this four stars. It is very much a solid holiday themed rom-com. So our main character is Malin and she essentially ends up going in this time loop a la Groundhog Day where she relives the same few days over and over again until she can get them right essentially. And and I enjoyed this. I especially really liked all of the different side characters, Malin's family in particular. I thought that they were really cute and entertaining characters. Um, the romance between her and Andrew I thought was adorable as well, although I did not like the conflict towards the end between the two of them. You know, this is a very typical thing in romance novels where like in the third act there's like a big breakup or a big conflict between the two main characters. And I just feel like it was kind of stupid, like Andrew's reaction to the things that Malin was telling him. I just, yeah, I thought it was dumb. But other than that, I thought this was really adorable and I definitely recommend, especially if you're already a fan of Christina Lauren. And I did want to note that just like with the Unhoneymooners, this book has a zero smut. All of these sex scenes are fade to black. So I just thought that I would mention that as well. Next up, we have Once Upon a Winter's Eve by Tessa Dare. This is technically book 1.5 in her Spindle Cove series, but it's a novella in that series of hers. And and this was just a fun time. I always have fun with Tessa Dare's works. I gave this one three stars. At first I gave it four stars, but upon reflection I just realized that it's definitely not nearly as good as some of her other books that I have read. And this is just a fun wintry adventure. It takes place over the course of one night and it is a second chance romance between the two main characters. So yeah, I don't really have much more to say. It was just a fun time. And then I also listened to The Greatest Gift by Philip Van Doren Stern, I believe that's the author's name. I keep getting it wrong in my head. So you'll see the cover over here. But this is the very, 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 very short story that is the inspiration for It's a Wonderful Life, the iconic movie. I also gave this three stars because it was just such a short story that we didn't really get any character development. There just wasn't time for any of that. I feel like this story didn't really add all that much to my experience of knowing this story overall. So I don't really recommend it, but I mean, it was something to listen to to pass the time. And I don't necessarily think that it was a waste of time. So do with that information what you will. Next up, we have A Very Highland Holiday. This was by quite a few authors. I think there were six short stories in total. And this is a historical romance bind up. And and all of these stories centered around the Battle of Culloden, which took place in 1746, I believe, in Scotland. And it also centers around this particular tavern slash inn. And most of these stories were very meh. The only two stories that I really enjoyed were Kerrigan Burns, which that one I think was called The Earl of Christmas Past. And then I also really enjoyed Eliza Knight's story. And I don't remember what that one was called, but it was a How the Grinch Stole Christmas retail telling and I thought it was just so much fun. So I definitely recommend those two short stories and I know that Kerrigan Burns was also published separately so you don't even need to read this bind up to read 
this story, but I think for Eliza Knights, you will have to check out this bind up to read it, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, all the other novellas I just felt very meh about. Most of the short stories had very little romance, and this is a historical romance bind up, so I'm gonna go into it expecting more romance. So yeah, it definitely wasn't my favorite anthology. And next up, we have Once Upon a Christmas Eve, not to be confused with Once Upon a Winter's Eve, um, but this one is by Elizabeth Hoyt. This is a novella in her Maiden Lane series, and so I was definitely definitely really excited about going into this one because I have read Scandalous Desires, which I think is book three in this series, and I really enjoyed it. But unfortunately, this one was also kind of meh for me. I think my main issue is that this story should have been a full novel, in my opinion, because things were just happening way too quickly between the two main characters. So this one's kind of a hate to love story. Um, our main hero, I think his name was Adam, if I'm not mistaken, he's kind of a rake. And then we have our heroine, and I think her name is Sarah. I don't quite remember these stories anymore um, and she just doesn't like rakes at all and so yeah it's kind of a hate to love thing going on and yeah I just feel like there wasn't enough time to develop them as characters and to develop their relationship and then at the end when he proposed to her it just happened way too fast and it was just unbelievable so I unfortunately don't really recommend this one but at the same time it wasn't terrible by any means. And then the last book that I read for the Tis the Season of Thon readathon is The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. If you guys watched that reading vlog, you will know that I went on and on just raving about this book for like a solid 10 minutes, I would say. And there was even more footage that didn't make the final cut where I was just going on and on and on about how amazing this book is. You know, this book totally meets the hype and in my opinion surpasses it. It's just that phenomenal of a book. For those of you guys that do not know what this book is, it is is technically an adult fantasy, but I personally think that YA audiences could read this and be just fine. So this follows our main character Linus Baker and he works for the department in charge of magical youth and he essentially goes to all these different orphanages and makes sure that things are being run well and that the people in charge of these orphanages are doing a good job with the children. And so he gets this special assignment by extremely upper management to go to this house in the Cerulean Sea on a cliff right here in the picture. And there are six children living at this house that are very extreme cases. They all have very special and different abilities, things like that. There's also the most adorable and wholesome romance with Linus and Arthur who runs this house. And it is just absolutely everything. This is the book that you need to read if you want to cry happy tears. I cried so much while reading this. I definitely recommend checking out my reading vlog if for nothing else than my discussion about this book because I went more in depth about Linus's character in general and the children and just things that this book did so so well. Okay so like I said that was all of the books that I read for Tis the Seasonathon and so I think what I'm going to do going forward in this video is talk about the books that I liked the least and work my way up to my five star reads for this past week or so. So the first book I want to talk about is Uzumaki by Junji Ito. This one I did end up giving three stars unfortunately. I'm definitely disappointed that I ended up giving this a three stars because I thought that going into it I was going to love it and maybe even give it five stars. So let me tell you a little bit of what this manga is about. It is a bind up of like several volumes, I think. The basic premise is that we have our main character. I can't even remember anybody's names <laughs> at this point, um, but they live in this town on the coast of Japan that is cursed with spirals. And I think I'm going to leave the synopsis at that. Um, I will say the idea was so intriguing and now I am seeing the spiral shape in so many things in my everyday life that I feel like I didn't notice before. So that is interesting. And I was really enjoying like the first half. There were some really great stories because like I said, it's a bind up of volumes. So there's several different like episodic stories. But then in the second half, it just got really repetitive. There were several stories that were about basically the same thing. And I just found that it wasn't as interesting as the first half. So I definitely started skimming, especially like the last two stories, I would say, which is just very disappointing because 
like I said, I really wanted to love this and so many people just rave and rave and rave about Junji Ito in general and Uzumaki seems to be like his most well-known and his most popular work. So yes, unfortunately for me, this didn't really work, but I still would recommend checking it out for yourself because it's a very interesting premise. If you're into horror manga, this is definitely one that I would recommend checking out. Next book I want to discuss is Lakewood by Megan Giddings. So this is a horror novel. So this is the kind of horror novel that is definitely slower paced. It's definitely more unsettling than anything else. But let me just tell you a little bit of what this is about. So we have our main character, Lena Johnson, and her grandmother has passed away and her mother is very, very ill. And they just do not have the money to afford all of their medical bills and things like that. So she ends up getting recruited into this memory study. I guess you can say that's what it is. And it ends up being so much more than that. There's definitely very weird and creepy and eerie things going on in this study. And also all of the subjects are people of color and all of the people running the study are white. So there's definitely a lot of racial discussions brought up. I think that's the main point of this novel. It's definitely based on things like the Tuskegee experiments. And unfortunately, there are a lot more experiments that have gone on in this country and maybe are still going on in this country involving black black people and people of color in general. So I did end up giving this 3.5 stars. It's definitely not a bad book by any means. I mean, this book is indeed kind of horrifying and unsettling, like I said. And there were a lot of quotes that I underlined throughout. Like there is some great writing going on. I do want to mention that this is Megan Giddings debut and you can kind of tell by the writing. And that was my main problem was I feel like there was a lot of telling and not showing in general. And I also feel like Megan Giddings could have just gone a bit further with the story in general and I think that she I don't know I feel like she could have gone a bit further with the horror and I know I'm not the only one that feels this way because this book only has like a 3.5 average rating on Goodreads so it's definitely not like a beloved book by any means um however I still would recommend checking it out it does kind of give me vibes of when no one is watching by Alyssa Cole as well as kind of get out you know the movie that Jordan Peele made so definitely if you're a fan of those things I would recommend checking this out as well next up we have The Hazelwood by Melissa Albert I finally read this this has been on like two TBRs at this point. I definitely mentioned it in both my October and November TBRs. So I'm glad that I finally read this. If you don't know what this is about, this is a definitely darker and more twisted YA fantasy. We have our main character, Alice. So Alice's grandmother has now passed away by the beginning of this book. And she was the author of these very like dark and twisted fairy tales based in this land called the Hinterland. And essentially what happens is that Alice's mother ends up getting kidnapped and it turns out that the hinterland is actually a real place. So I overall enjoyed this. Definitely the first half more so than the second half. Like the first half had a really great mystery. I really liked Alice and Finch's characters, not only separately, but as they were working together to solve the mystery of what happened to her mother. I will say that the second half definitely gets more confusing. It kind of feels like you're on an acid trip or something like that, kind of like a fever dream. And I did find myself feeling less engaged because of that, but I know that it was written to be that way on purpose. So like, I understand what Melissa Albert was getting at, but at the same time, I just wasn't as interested as I was in the first half. So I did overall give this four stars. I don't think I'm gonna continue on with the sequel. And then I know that Melissa Albert also released least like The Tales of the Hinterland, which is the book that Alice's grandmother wrote. So I do think that that's very interesting. But yeah, the ending of this, I feel like there was a cliffhanger kind of, but it just wasn't enough to motivate me to read the sequel. Next up, we have a really fun Christmas romance novella. This is Stocking Stuffers by Erin McClellan. This is definitely a very, very, very smutty novella. So definitely be aware of that before going into this. So I did overall give this four stars. I really enjoyed it. I'm just going to list a few of the things that this novella features. So we have a sweet cinnamon roll love interest who looks like a lumberjack. We have really hot sex scenes. We also have a bisexual main character who sells sex toys and uses them liberally on said love interest. And we have cheesy Hallmark Christmas movie goodness slash realness. And of course there is forced proximity slash snowed in at a BNB because basically the whole premise is that our main character is selling sex toys to this like raunchy book club at this BNB and they all get snowed in. And so she ends up in very close quarters with Perry, who is the brother of the owner of the BNB. So yeah, 
it's a fun time. I definitely recommend it if you're looking for some Christmas smutty goodness. Next up, I want to discuss The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. So this is a 2020 horror release that I have been looking forward to reading for quite some time and I'm so glad that I finally did. So basically this centers around these four Native American men and when they were about 18 years old, they went elk hunting in a part of the reservation that they were not allowed to go hunting in. So they end up hunting at least like nine elk, I think. And because of that whole event, there is now this elk-like entity that is bent on revenge against them. And this is the horror novel that I didn't even know that I needed because I've never read a horror novel that centers around hunters and that idea is just so intriguing to me. First of all, I highly, highly, highly recommend checking out reviews from Native American or Indigenous reviewers and authors. There's also some really great blurbs on the back by Native American authors that I definitely recommend checking out. I'm also going to link a video down below of of a live discussion that Kayla from Books and La La did with a couple of other booktubers and I know that one of the booktubers I think his name is Brody he is Native American and in that discussion he brought up so many amazing points about this novel and about the culture that he grew up in that I think is really helpful to know about after you read the book because obviously that discussion brings up spoilers so I would definitely recommend reading this first and then checking out that discussion video like I said it will be linked down below some issues that I thought were discussed really well in this book is this overall cycle of violence and injustice, revenge, guilt, and identity, just to name a few different things. This book, while there are some parts that are slower paced, there is also quite a bit of horror and murder going on. So I mean, definitely be aware of that before going into this. So I did end up giving this four, maybe 4.5 stars. And for me, I think that was a little bit of the writing. As amazing as Stephen Graham Jones's writing is, it did take me a while to get into the style and to really like immerse myself in it if that makes sense and also at the beginning of this book there's a lot of like terminology and vernacular that's thrown around and I think that Stephen Graham Jones overall does a pretty good job of immersing non-native readers into the story but at the same time there were quite a few points where I was confused and I was like wait what are they talking about what's going on so I mean I would also be aware of that before going into this book but Overall, I thought it was really great. I'm really looking forward to checking out more from Stephen Graham Jones. I've heard that his short stories in particular are amazing. So I'm definitely looking forward to reading more from him and seeing what he comes out with next. All right, so now it's time to talk about some five-star reads. The first one that I want to bring up is Succubus Dreams by Rochelle Mead. So this is book three in her Georgina Kincaid slash Succubus Blues series. This is a paranormal adult romance series that centers around Georgina Kincaid, who is a succubus, which is a demon that feeds off of the life energy of mortal men. And I loved this installment just as much as the first two this installment in particular centers around this like weird being slash entity that is like feeding off of Georgina's dreams which that was a really interesting plot point. Um, there's also this kind of forbidden romance going on between Georgina and Seth who is a mortal author and he's actually the author of like her favorite book series ever and uh, I just love all of the characters so much. You know I have read her YA books at this point both the Vampire Academy series and the Bloodline series and I feel like this is her best writing in general. I don't even know what to say at this point but I have given every book in this series so far five stars and I have a feeling that I'm going to give the rest of the books in the series five stars as well. So highly highly recommend if you're looking for an adult paranormal romance series that offers something a little bit different because we are centered around a succubus. There are also like imps and demons and vampires and other creatures like that involved as well. Um, so yeah it's just such a fun time. Next up I want to discuss a book that completely blew me away and I didn't really expect it to and that is Wolf by Wolf by Ryan Grodin. So this is book one in a YA historical speculative fiction duology. So this enters around the idea of what if Hitler and the Axis powers won World War II and that idea alone immediately drew me in. So this is a part of her author's note and I think this is really interesting. So she says, 
What if Hitler had made the decision to execute Operation Sea Lion invading Britain in the summer of 1940? What if, instead of attacking Pearl Harbor, the Japanese aided Hitler's assault on the Soviet Union, causing Stalin to fight a two-front war? What if the Americans had held fast to the isolationist policies that were so popular in the United States during the 1930s? So basically to commemorate the Axis powers victory during World War II, there is this annual motorcycle race. That starts from Germania, which is what used to be Berlin. And what was really interesting is that Ryan Grodin mentioned in her author's note that Hitler had plans to rename Berlin Germania. So anyways, the race starts in Germania and it's like one huge U shape. It goes all the way through Europe into parts of Africa, into Asia, and then loops all the way up to Tokyo, Japan. And so we have our main character, Yael. And when she was six years old, she is Jewish and she was taken to a concentration camp with her mother. And so Yael was experimented upon and she became a skin shifter. So she can change her outward appearance. The only things that she can't change is her gender and things that are like embedded in her skin, like wounds or tattoos. And she is now a part of the resistance that is trying to take down Hitler. And so she impersonates one of the racers in this motorcycle race so that she can win the race and get close enough to Hitler to murder him herself. Oh my god, this book was fantastic. I couldn't give it less than five stars. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. I mean, the stakes couldn't be higher, right? She's impersonating somebody else. She's trying to murder Hitler, who probably has some of the strongest security of anybody on the planet, right? And wow, it was just absolutely fantastic. Yael is an icon. I love following her character. She is just so brave and courageous. She's been through so much, but she is more than ready and willing and able to finish her mission. I am planning on reading Blood for Blood, which is the second book, um, probably in a few days. And then I also did read Iron to Iron by Ryan Grodin. So this is the novella that takes place between this book, Wolf by Wolf, and Blood for Blood, which is the second book, like I said. And so this novella is following Luca Leuven, who was a pretty major character in this book. So Luca is actually one of the other racers in Wolf by Wolf. He's also participated in numerous races before this one and so this novella is following the race of 1955 essentially whereas this one is the 1956 one. And I just loved getting Luca's POV because I immediately was drawn to his character in Wolf by Wolf and he kind of reminds me a little bit of Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, he's just a fun character but he's also really intriguing and interesting. I gave this one five stars as well and I definitely recommend checking this out if you are reading the series as a whole because this novella does add a lot of context to the story that you don't get in Wolf by Wolf. This was definitely a very important story that needed to be told and I'm so glad that Ryan Grodin did write a separate novella about it. So yes, I cannot recommend, you know, Wolf by Wolf and Iron to Iron enough and I've heard that Blood for Blood is even better than this book so I am so pumped to get to it ASAP. All right guys, we have one last book to talk about in this video and that is How the King of Elfame Learned to Hate Stories by Holly Black. Ugh. I am so excited that I have this book in my hands now and that I read it. Oh, it was so, so good. So this is a novella that takes place in the world of the Cruel Prince series. Basically, this is a bind up of several short stories. Some of them take place before the events of the Cruel Prince series and some of them take place after. So I definitely would recommend waiting to read this until after you read the last book of that trilogy. First of all, I have to commend Ravina Kai, who was the illustrator for this book, because there are stunning, absolutely stunning, stunning illustrations in this book. Oh my god, like I cannot recommend getting the physical book for yourself. It's not enough to just listen to the audiobook. There are just so many gorgeous illustrations in this book. And this was just the perfect little addition to this series that we all know and love. And I did read this on my birthday, which was on December 14th, and it was just like the perfect little novella to read on that day. Ugh, cannot recommend it enough. I of course gave it five stars. All right, guys, that's going to be it for this mid-December wrap up. I would love it if you would leave a comment with the Christmas tree emoji. I'll put it over here if you got to this point in the video. And I would also love it if you would leave a like and subscribe. And I thank you in advance if you do. And with that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!